Welcome to Equipping the Body. I'm Dr. Brad Starnes, and today we are beginning Luke chapter number two. We have finished Luke chapter one, and we are now beginning the second chapter of the gospel according to St. Luke. And we're going to examine the first 20 verses, okay, of Luke chapter two with this theme, which is derived straight from the text, the birth of the beloved at Bethlehem. Now, you ought to be able to gather from this title that the beloved is Jesus, and we're going to talk about his birth at Bethlehem. So the birth of the beloved at Bethlehem. Now, as I've told you before, it's believed, and, and I do believe this, uh, that Luke interviewed Mary herself in preparation to write his gospel. Um, and we've gone to great lengths to make a big deal of how Luke carefully went through every detail. And in Luke's prologue, Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4, he talks about his resources, um, his sources, both written and oral, that he went through great detail. Remember, Luke was a medical doctor. He had a very high level of training, even in such a primitive time as he lived. And so Luke was also uh, very fluent uh, in writing high Greek, uh, which Luke 1, 1 through 4, the prologue represents some of the highest Greek we have uh, left, even among other writings uh, outside the Bible. So Luke was a very careful uh, writer, hence why his gospel by far is the longest. Now, considering these things, it makes perfect sense that his narrative of the birth of Jesus is the longest and has the most detail. Okay, that makes perfect sense. So the birth of the beloved at Bethlehem. Now we're going to see this narrative in four parts. Okay, First of all, the divine incarnation, verses 1 through 7. Secondly, the angelic annunciation, verses 8 through 16. Thirdly, the gospel presentation, verses 17 through 20. And fourthly, the Jewish dedication, in verses uh, 21 through 24. So we're actually going a little bit past verse 20, but uh, I'll explain that as we go. So let's read our text and then get started. And I'll actually just read the portions we're dealing with one at a time. I don't want to overwhelm you. Chapter 2, verse 1, book of Luke. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And so we see a divine incarnation. Now, why do I call this section uh, the divine incarnation? Well, Jesus was no ordinary child. He was God incarnate, the creator of the universe, who took on the flesh of man, came as a baby, born in a manger. And what about his divine incarnation? Okay, so let's, let's dig a little further. We know that God became man, okay, in the incarnation. Well, I want you to notice the humiliation of his incarnation. By this, I mean the humble circumstances of which Jesus was born and that he humbled himself. And so the humiliation of the incarnation to take on the flesh of a mortal, though he himself was immortal. And so the creator allowed himself to be made like, keyword like, those he had created. At first, Luke begins with the setting the timeline of Jesus' birth. Much debate has been given concerning this timeline. For he wrote a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this census took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Now the debate goes like this. That Quirinius was not governor of Syria at the time of Jesus' birth. Well, that, that, that's a misnomer, okay? Sir William Ramsey, the archaeologist, discovered that a Quirinarius apparently held two office, two separate times, okay, which completely opens the possibility that this registry was done during his reign. However, 
Once again, archaeological evidence has shown that they most certainly did have registries or censuses every 14 years for the purpose of taxation and to identify those eligible for compulsory military service. While the Jews were exempt from military service, because anybody knows their history, they're going to fire back and say, well, the Jews were exempt. That's true. But they had to pay a special tax for that exemption above and beyond the normal taxation of citizenship in the Roman Empire. So naturally, they were called to register. Now, some, still not satisfied with this argument, say, well, you know, it doesn't make sense that he would have done it at this time. Well, it makes perfect sense when we know that Herod delayed the census uh, under his reign because of things that were going on, some infighting and some uh, insurgency among the Jews, uh, such as the group, the Zealots, and so he was attempting to appease the people. So, again... The skeptics come and say, well, the Bible's got an error because he wasn't governor. But once again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, archaeology has proven the Bible. That's what I love about God's Word. Is unlike any other religious book in the world, history and archaeology prove the Bible. And there's many examples of that, but we don't have time. So we have a government calling for its subjects to register themselves in their hometown. So Joseph takes his wife and travels to Bethlehem because he was of the bloodline of David, thus making this his home of record. Now some have questioned why Mary would make such a long trip with child. However, consider this. Joseph is not going to leave his pregnant wife at home to make this journey. Furthermore, she herself was a descendant of David, so difficult as the journey may be for a mother late in pregnancy, this was, not a, uh, this was not a time when one could file taxes electronically. So the journey was necessary. Now, while they were there, she brought forth her firstborn child, the divine incarnation, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger. The cities would have been extremely overcrowded with the census going on, and so it's perfectly legitimate that they were unable to find lodging. As far as the idea that Jesus was born in a stable, of that we cannot be sure. It could have been a con, which was a closed enclosed area of animal pens of sorts that housed travelers. And many have suggested, I believe it was Justin Martyr that first suggested, but I could be wrong on that. Sometimes my church history gets mixed, mixed up. Many have suggested it was a cave in, of sorts carved out in a hill outside where livestock were stored. Nevertheless, it was certainly a humble and lowly birth. The irony should not be lost on us, okay? The humiliation of the divine incarnation is this, that the king of kings was born among the animals to poor parents living in the poor part of town. There's nothing more humble than the king of the world being born under such circumstances. Note why I said the humiliation of the divine incarnation. Now let's compare the irony here that in our day, the so-called royal families give birth to their children in palaces as the whole world waits by the television to celebrate for some reason that's lost on me. But the king of the universe, God incarnate, should be born in an animal pen amongst filth wrapped in rags. That's amazing to me. William Barclay writes that one European monarch of yesteryear was caught walking amongst the common people in disguise when stopped for security reasons. Uh, he was asked what he was doing. And people said, you can't do this, sire. You know, somebody might recognize you're the king and try to assassinate you. But he said this, how am I supposed to rule the people if I do not know how they live? Ladies and gentlemen, we have a savior that endured the most humble of human circumstances so that he could be the high priest that understands, as the book of Hebrews says, the feelings of our infirmities. He has experienced the human experience. And all of that's wrapped up in the divine incarnation that he allowed himself to be made a little lower than the angels and humbled himself to the point of death. Something else to be mentioned here. The text says her firstborn, not her only born. Now for centuries, the Roman Catholic Church has taught the perpetual virginity of Mary in order to deify her. Yet the Bible is clear that Jesus had siblings. We find him talking with them in the book of John. And one of his brothers, James, wrote a book in the Bible. 
This idea that Mary ne never had another child and therefore remained a virgin is not only foreign to the account of Scripture, but it is ridiculous in every way, and that is putting it mildly. Now, the Greek word used here is protocon, that is firstborn, firstborn. If Luke wanted to teach that she had no other children, especially considering his high level of education and command of high Greek, demonstrating his prologue, Luke would have used the word monogene, which means only born. Now, did Luke make a mistake or did the Catholic Church make a mistake? My money's against the Catholic Church. Luke didn't make a mistake. Luke knew the Greek language well. I remind you, in addition to his education, Luke was a Gentile, ladies and gentlemen. This was his native tongue. He could have just as easily used the Greek word that means only child, but instead he used the Greek word that means first child. And so Mary did not remain a virgin. Jesus had half-brothers and sisters, same mama, different daddy. Now, lastly, we find that there was no room for them in the inn, which foreshadows the truth of Christ's time here on earth, for he had no place to lay his head. Now, before I move on from the divine incarnation, let me ask you a question. Is there room for the humble Lord in the home of your heart? Or like the innkeeper, does the sign outside your heart read, No Vacancy? Not only the divine incarnation, but in verses 8 through 16, notice secondly the angelic annunciation. And so we come to verse 8. It says, Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them. Shone round about them. And they were greatly afraid. So would I be. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will towards men. And so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, and which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. So Luke suddenly changes scenes to another location. From the manger, he moves to the fields. And as he writes, there was in the same country, and he talks about these shepherds. We need to keep in mind that shepherds in this day were ostracized. They were outcasts. Their job was dirty, and it completely disabled them from maintaining the meticulous washings and cleansings of the ceremonial law. Therefore, most of the shepherds did not practice Judaism to the extent that the other Jews did because their job had them constantly in a state of ceremonial uncleanliness according to the Mosaic law. And so they, these were the people that Jesus came to first. Man, that's beautiful to me. Not only was their job dirty, it was difficult. Okay, Their job was difficult. Ladies and gentlemen, they had to sleep outside with the sheep. They had to feed the sheep, water the sheep, shear the sheep, show the sheep where to go. If you know anything about sheep, they're among the dumbest animals on earth. And I don't mean that in a mean way, but they have no natural defense. And, and I didn't know this until I studied this passage. Sheep will graze down to the dirt, and if the shepherd doesn't move them, they will begin to eat the dirt. And so their job was not only difficult... But it was dirty. Not only that, but it was dangerous. We're on an alliteration kick this morning. It was a dangerous job because in the field they faced robbers, muggers, as well as wild animals that sent many a shepherd to an early grave. They were poor. This was not the sort of line of work that one went in to make a fortune. Yet this is exactly the people that the news of Christ came to first. The loveliness of this must be understood. That the gospel of Christ, listen ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. The good news, it's not for the rich. It's not only for the privileged. It's for everyone and anyone who repent and believe the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That in, in a way to show that, to foreshadow that, because the Bible says in the Old Testament that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach uh, the gospel to the poor. Man, that's good. That's good to know. 
And so he came to the shepherds whose job was dirty, dangerous, and difficult. And so we see it was universal. So this also coincides with Luke's purpose being a Gentile, writing to Gentile believers and to a Gentile audience to show the universality of Christ, that Christ was the Savior of the Jews, but not just the Jews, but also also the Gentile. I'm so glad that Paul agreed with Luke in Romans 1.16 when he made this statement, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and salvation to everyone that believed, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I want to tell you something. I'm not Jewish as far as I know. I've studied my family history, but I haven't found uh, any evidence that I'm Jewish. So it's good news to old dirty white boy from Campabella that Jesus came to save me too. And I celebrate that, and I hope you do. And so he goes to these shepherds. Now, consider something else. These men are doing their job And all of a sudden, an angel appears and the Shekinah glory of the Lord falls, that great and unbearable light that surrounded the temple in the Old Testament at times, that light that man cannot look upon with the naked eye, the glorious light of the purity of God, the same light that made Moses' face glow for days after exposure, and it fell around some roughneck shepherds in a cold field on a dark night. And now, you'll see why I call it the angelic annunciation now the angels have an announcement and they bring the good news and the angel tells the shepherds don't be afraid we've brought good news the evangelion the good news of jesus christ what we know is the gospel the angel exclaims good tidings of great joy which will be to all people for there is born to you in this day in the city of david a savior who is christ the lord again confirming that jesus came not only to save israel but anyone who repents and believes. After telling the shepherds where to find Jesus, the heavenly host begins to sing goodwill towards men, glory to God in the highest, and on earth goodwill towards men. This is interesting, okay? This is a point of fact. These fields in Bethlehem were owned by the temple, and these shepherds had the job of raising lambs for the slaughter at the temple. So don't miss the the undeniable irony that in the same field that they were raising up lambs to slay for the temple, the angels come and say, the lamb has come. And who do they tell first? The men raising the lambs, plural, under the old covenant way of life. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that a beautiful connection? Isn't that a lovely thought? Secondly, by way of historical context, if you know your history and you know your Bible history, then you know that in this culture, when a, when a Jewish family had a baby, the neighbors would come and sing and celebrate the birth of a child, especially a male child. If it was a female, they would go away and mourn. Okay, And there was different protocols for male versus female. Now, Get this, when Jesus is born, it ain't the neighbors that come and sing. It's the very angels of heaven, the glorious celestial choir comes because when the king is born, the neighbors with their homemade instruments aren't going to cut it. It's got to be the heavenly choir that celebrates his birth. Isn't that a beautiful thought? that according to the customs of the day, there was music, but it wasn't from the neighbors. It was from heaven. Also, in the Greek, it doesn't really come through in the English that well, but in the Greek, it it seems to insinuate that it wasn't just the angels they could see singing, but it was all the angels in heaven, plural, that were singing together. Man, I just glory in that. How lovely it is the thought that heaven sent its own musicians to declare and celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. How fitting, because human words, as lovely as they can be, fall short of describing the wonderful excellencies of the Lord Jesus Christ. No, to celebrate his birth properly, the band had to be supernatural and the music divine. Now, not only the angelic annunciation. But I want you to notice thirdly in the text with me, as we continue in verse 17, the gospel presentation. 
the gospel present. Look at verse 17. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. The gospel presentation. What do I mean by this? Well, according to verse 17, and then if you even go down to verse 20, we find that the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. So these shepherds take the news of Christ and they tell others. And if you will, they present the gospel to others. So look at me and tell me, I know you can't see me in the radio, but if you could, Look at me and tell me that that's anything but a gospel presentation. These shepherds didn't go to seminary like I did. They didn't study their Bibles. Maybe they did. We don't know. And they didn't have to go through a new believers class. You know what they did? They heard the gospel. They celebrated. And when they went and saw Jesus, they went and told everybody else. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you hear me clearly. If you have seen Jesus, spiritually speaking, if you have truly been saved, then you will have a desire to tell everybody. And so we see the gospel presentation of the shepherds. It's beautiful. Now, they were told of the Lord Jesus because the angel evangelized to them. This is interesting. In the Greek, it reads not only, I, I bring you good tidings, but it, it reads this way. I evangelized to you a great joy. So they were evangelized, and you know what they did? They went around evangelizing, uh, participating in evangelism. So in short, this is nothing but the gospel presentation. Now, before we move to our last point, I want to ask you something. Have you seen the Lord Jesus, spiritually speaking? I don't mean literally, but spiritually. Has the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to truly see him for what he is, as the shepherds did? If he has, then you will come to the conclusion Isaiah did when he saw the train of the glory fill the temple. He said, I'm unclean. When you really see Jesus for who he is, it reveals to you who you are. Then you must repent and believe the gospel. Now, if all this is true, and we believe it is, then like the shepherds, go present the gospel. So we see the gospel presentation. Then finally, in verses 21 through 24, and I cannot stress this enough, Jesus was a Jew. He didn't break the law. He fulfilled the law. So lastly, we see the Jewish dedication, not the gospel presentation only, but lastly, the Jewish dedication, simply meaning this. Joseph and Mary, after Jesus was born, put him through the ceremonial dedication and rituals as per the Old Covenant. First, he was circumcised on the eighth day, per the law. A male child was to be circumcised on the eighth day. We saw that for John the Baptist, and Paul mentions it in the New Testament, himself being a Jew. And so at this time, Jesus did the same. On the eighth day, the male child was also to be named. Now, we know they had already received the name from the Lord through the angel Gabriel, but it was made public on the eighth day of his circumcision. Everything about Jesus was according to the law. Now, I heard this heretic the other day, and he said, Jesus broke the law for you. Ladies and gentlemen, that's blasphemous. Jesus has never sinned. He didn't break the law. He fulfilled the law. And that man ought to resign tomorrow and get an honest job. And so we see that Mary uh, takes him to the temple to dedicate him. Now, she herself has to go through purification because according to the law, a woman giving birth was ceremonial unclean for a certain amount of time depending on the gender of the child. For a male child, it was 40 days. For a woman child, it was 80 days. Now, she was allowed to do about her house, her motherly duties. However, she could not partake in religious activity per Leviticus chapter 12 until after that period. Then she was to bring the offering to the Lord and to bring her child and dedicate them. This is a true dedication to the Lord. So let me read the text to you. Verse 21. And when the eight days were completed for the circumcision of this child, his name was called Jesus, just like I told you, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now, when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were completed, Leviticus chapter 12, if you need to fact check me, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as is written in the law of the Lord. Every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. As you know, the law made provision for the poor. If they couldn't afford a lamb, they could bring two turtle doves or two pigeons, which further uh, 
solidifies the humble circumstances of his birth. You see, we've missed the true dedication of children. I, I've seen it, and, and, and I'll just tell you, it's, I've seen it as a pastor. We want you to dedicate our baby, okay? And then it turns into a photo op, and you never see the parents or the baby ever again. That's not what a dedication is. A true biblical baby dedication is when you stand before a local congregation and give your word that you're going to raise that child, not only in the ways of the Lord, but in that congregation. And so take a lesson from the birth of Jesus. That's what true dedication is. Now, considering the application, we're not under the old covenant and we're not Jewish. I get that. But the principle is universal that we are to dedicate our children to the Lord. And that means to disciple them, to raise them up in the house of God. So in conclusion, we've seen the birth of the beloved at Bethlehem. We noted that Luke spared no detail. And we saw the divine incarnation in its humiliation, verses 1 through 7. We saw the angelic annunciation, verses 8 through 16. We saw the gospel presentation, verses 17 through 20. And finally, the Jewish dedication, verses 21 through 24. Now, while it is a riveting story, the question is, how does this apply to me? Because when I wake up tomorrow morning, what can I do with this sermon? Well, simply this. Take inventory. Do you truly know the Lord Jesus Christ? Does he, if, if you'll allow me to use the text, does he live in the end of your heart? Secondly, be a shepherd. What I mean by that, do what the shepherds did. If you know Jesus, go tell somebody else about Jesus. How's that for an application? I mean, we look at the text and we see what the people did in the text, and the best thing you can ever do is participate in the Great Commission, which is to go and to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ, which in a sense is exactly what the shepherds did. So what do I do with this sermon, Pastor? You go and tell people about Jesus. You see, these shepherds, and, and, and listen, people say, well, you know, Pastor, I'm not qualified. Honey, you don't have to be qualified. God don't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. These shepherds didn't go to seminary. They didn't uh, go through the committee. I hate committees, by the way. And they didn't even go to Sunday school. They didn't have the approval of the local Baptist Association. Oh, no. They simply went and told the things they had seen and done concerning the Lord Jesus. If anything, you have an advantage over them because you have a Bible. And so go and tell the good news. There is a Savior and His name is Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, the birth of the beloved at Bethlehem. Seen in four parts. The divine incarnation. The angelic annunciation. The gospel presentation. And finally, the Jewish dedication. God bless you. Keep digging in the book of Luke.